The province I'm in right now has over 100 active forest fires. As of 14 hours ago, it's probably grown since then. Almost all of our provinces are on fire on the western half of Canada. And so because of that, if you're in the northern U.S., if you're in western Canada, and I'm sure it's going to make its way east, you're probably covered in a haze similar to this. This is not a fog. The overcastness of this is not because we're at dusk or because it's cloudy. It is all smoke. That's what we're talking about here today how forest fire smoke can harm or affect your plants and actually how you can help your plants, not prevent, unfortunately, but how you can help your plants through this once we get out on the other side, because fingers crossed we actually end up on the other side of this and we don't have a completely smoky summer. Okay, first off, let's go through what it does to the plant. So number one thing is that it actually benefits the plants. Sounds bizarre, I know, but forest fires release a ton of CO2. Last year alone, which is a record setting year for forest fires in Canada 2023, we released over three, let me double check this before you fact, three billion tons of CO2 in the air, which by the way is more than like 642 million cars and all the planes in the world supposedly, uh, which is crazy. So that CO2 is released into the atmosphere and plants love CO2. They literally eat the garbage out of the air and turn it into oxygen. So in some sense, the plants are actually benefiting from this excess influx of CO2. So you may, in many cases, see much larger plants, but much more foliage in the event that the other circumstances begin to mitigate themselves or you're able to correct the other negative effects because the rest is all negative as to what it does to your plant. So number two factor is actually the smoke itself. So while the air has higher levels of CO2, the haze unfortunately has particulate matter. If we have a fire in the house, we can kind of see such. Well, this haze is particulate matter and that particulate matter unfortunately does tend to stick to things and it will land eventually if it was to rain right now all the particulate matter in the sky is now going to be on the ground slash on your plants and so because of that the plants leaves become coated both the top and the bottom so let's talk about the bottom first the bottom and the top both have stomata cells now stomatas they look like lips some people may disagree. This is coming from a straight female though, so I mean, I could be entirely wrong. I digress. This stomata has something called guard cells, and the guard cells are actually what makes that lip look. And they're located, again, on the top and the bottom, but in a higher density on the bottom of your leaf. These allow for the transfer of gas. It's a passive transport when it comes to CO2, and essentially the guard cells open up so long as it's not too hot, it's not too sunny, and the humidity is at the right level. And this allows CO2 to slow in. However, when it's covered in a thin layer of smoke or particulate matter, and this goes for any particulates, just a heads up, it doesn't have to just be smoke. It could be, you know, soil, you need it. Thing is not as much CO2 is uptaken. So in a way, the plant is actually choking, for lack of a better term. And because of that, it's not able to uptake CO2. Now, we know CO2 is important, and we know it's important because it's part of the formula that makes up photosynthesis. So if photosynthesis can't take place because the CO2 isn't in the right quantity, then we don't end up with literally every single function within the plant, whether that's making more chlorophyll, whether that's putting on more leaves, making more flowers, carbohydrates, sweetening, you name it, literally every function is completely reliant on the CO2 getting in, in the proper quantity. Okay, so number two, um, where the particulate matter comes into play is the tops of the leaves. Now, there are stomata up there, lower density, but still there. The tops of your leaves, however, are entirely responsible for photosynthesis. And more particularly, the leaves that kind of make up the canopy of your plant, no, not so much the ones that are lower down, but the canopy ones, the ones that catch the most sun and are the, responsible for the most sun capture in the chlorophyll are also the first ones to be ransacked by the smoke particulate. And therefore, now your photosynthesis even it tumbles even farther because now your chlorophyll is actually covered. And we see this, whether it's again, smoke or it's dust in your house on your house plants. This is why cleaning off house plant leaves is incredibly important because you have reduced photosynthesis. So you can run all the grow lights you want, but if you have a thick layer of dust, you're just 
kind of wasting money um, and your plant could be much more effective if you dusted them, for example. So that's factor number two for where the plant's beginning to suffer. Now, if you are thinking to yourself, how do I know if my plant isn't uptaking CO2 in its choke? And how do I know if it's not getting enough photosynthesis? Well, your first sign is leaf loss, particularly on the lower leaves. So the plant begins to play triage. And when it plays triage, it usually begins to lose those bottom leaves. So you've two things you can do. In the meantime, while unfortunately everything's still cloudy and there's still particulate matter in the sky, you can go in and you can help that plant triage by pruning. So you prune off the leaves that are not necessary for that plant or would be beneficial to prune off anyways in the event that there was a pest or a disease of some sort. So I did a video on pruning tomatoes in a way that you won't lose massive yield. That way of pruning tomatoes will give you more tomatoes, yes, but it may not help you when your environment's like this. So like I said in that video, if you have a disease, a pest, or I guess smoke I did miss, you may want to take into consideration a higher, more intense clipping on that plant just to get it through kind of this next little stage. And again, you only have to do that if you're seeing like negative results from the smoke. Okay, so number two is literally washing your plant leaves. Now, I don't recommend this quite often, spraying plant leaves. There's good reason for it. You can get fungal issues, you can get bacterial issues. It just adds to the humidity in the canopy and it can go south pretty quick. So you need to gauge the cost benefit here. If you think to yourself, you know what, clearing the, these leaves off, getting this soot off is going to help my plant more than trying to prevent it against blight, which has not happened or you know, I'm not very exposed to. If that's the case, then go in, spray off your plant leaves, and you'll wanna do that every day if you can, if you can't on a semi-regular basis. Cause remember, kind of similar to like a, a home where you have a lot of cigarette smoke, there's layers, there's almost like a layer of soot. And so the more often we're removing that soot, the more likely we are to keep up with it. And the more likely that spraying the plant down will actually result in that soot kind of going down the drain, if you will. Now don't blast them with like the jet setting. Um, just use something like, not a mist, but it does need to have like a little bit of punch to it. So just like your classic nozzle spray type thing. Okay, so the next one is unfortunately nothing you can correct and nothing you could even fix in the meantime. And that unfortunately is just the lack of sun and the lack of sun causing obviously less intense sunlight. And I talked about this actually on Instagram in regards to solar lights and whether or not they affect your plants. Complete side note, but the intensity of the sun is reduced similar to like the solar lights I was talking about in that reel. And essentially you will have less photosynthesis than what you may be used to. The second thing is that it tends to get cooler when the sun has been blocked out. Now this might be a good thing if you're going through a heat wave, but it may not be a good thing if you've already had a cool spring and now you're having a very cool summer and you can't seem to escape the cold. Um, that may not work to your benefit. The only real prevention you could do is if you had a ray of sunshine in your life, such as myself. All the men out there that have rays of sunshines in their lives that are women, they help your plants, even if the sun won't. This next one applies to forest fires in spaces that have gone toxic. So this can happen when a forest fire is moved into a town, when a forest fire is moved into like a mining site, if uh, a forest fire is moved into a space where we know the stuff on, the material on fire is not just trees and it is building material or something of that nature. Now you have toxic smoke. When you wash the leaves, when it rains, and any exposed soil that's not properly mulched, you will end up with a lot of toxic load. Again, pending your distance from the sites that are on fire, you can end up with toxic load in your soil system. So number one would be a mulch and a heavy enough layer of mulch that then would be removed, unfortunately, um, and not composted, but thrown in the garbage. Number two is the solution to pollution is dilution. And so you could just add more soil, add more compost, add more peat, whatever you want, 
and essentially mix it into that top layer to dilute the toxicity that's in there that may affect your plants when you go to seed them the year after only because i don't think the toxicity is going to be that high and speaking of toxicity for plants and levels that may or may not be high you might want to check out this video right here on chlorine and whether or not you should be watering with tap water and then this video down here is actually what google said you should watch because they're watching you i'll talk to you guys next time bye